So first of all, we had William Proctor, who's not here, who was talking about the devolution of storytelling. And one of the things he said is, we're all amateur narratorologists. Then he spoke about fan wikis and how fans are making maps and stuff like that. There was a study done, actually, a few years ago for Intel in the US on how, as audiences, we engage with stories. And the research project came up with four levels of conversation between storytellers and audiences, which also works for brands and consumers. The first level is broadcast TV, which essentially they're saying is dead, right? So we watch television pipe down a tube that comes up in a screen in our house or on our laptop, and as broadcasters, they've got their fingers in their ears. They're not listening. The second level is welcome to my world. No, no, sorry. The second level is the I'm listening model. The I'm listening model is what they did with Justin Bieber's movie where they put out stills from the shoot online while they were shooting the movie. And they asked the audience or the fans on Twitter whether Bieber should wear the black hat or the white hat in the next scene. Of course, nobody was really listening, but it was kind of an, an illusion of listening back. The third level, I feel, is where um, William was on the idea of fan wikis. It was called the Welcome to My World model. And that's what was done with Tim Kring's TV series, Heroes, where there were assets from the show released online before the TV show went live. And by season three of Heroes, the fan wiki was better documented than the story bible that the writers had. Because the fans loved it so much, they added like tiny little details in that the writers didn't have in their bible. The fourth level was Take It, It's Yours, which is what Eric Kripke did with Supernatural Season 8, where he asked fans to create canon to add into the show. So I kind of felt that sort of touched on the fact that as audiences, we want to get involved. Then Diana spoke about connecting with your audience to keep them engaged. Um, then we had talk from Roger of about the emotional element of storytelling. And he also mentioned Trump and the meta-narratives, which I will go back to in a little while. And then, obviously, we had Matt just now talking about connecting with an audience. And we're now going to talk, Lincoln and I, um, about this idea of how, as an audience, do we tie into this? Because as a writer, like I come from a novelist background way back in the ancient times, right? And then when I wrote my books, I didn't really know who my audience were. I would go into bookshops and I'd spy and see who was picking up what kinds of books, but I didn't really know who they were. The idea now is, we need to know who we're writing for. Because writing is brilliant and I love it. And I'm lucky enough now that I've written for pretty much all of the platforms right across the board. And a little like Roger, my first play, I stood behind the curtain and looked out at the audience and saw them not laughing at the bits that I thought were funny and wiping a tear at the bits I thought were just a little bit sad. And it changed everything. So if we want to write for us, then it doesn't matter who we're writing for. But if we want to write for something more than just for us, then we need to know who we're writing for and how they engage. Like, it's difficult now even to sell a concept in of a TV show unless you can prove that concept and at least you can show to the publishers, the networks, that the audience wants something that you're creating. So in a way, I think the audience is now the boss. Talking about that now, <laughs> is Lincoln, who's done a lot of research on fandom, correct? A little bit, yeah. Okay, fandom research, fandom studies, science fiction, pop culture. Mm. So maybe we'll kick off with some of your research. On the knowledge, I might interrupt you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is meant to be that sort of okay. open live discussion. I'll take and a seat. Talking to Alison, and, and, and uh, she was talking to me uh, uh, a few weeks ago about the sort of work that she's done and the, interaction, the interactive element between uh, media techs and the audience. Uh, my research sort of sort of sort of slots right in the middle really as a sort of uh, I guess a paid up member of the sort of fan community a number of fan communities uh, a lot a lot of which were sort of mentioned today Star Wars Transformers I was very impressed by Billy's sort of uh, list of or, or sort of wiki of, of where sort of transmedia fandom has gotten it's much more detailed than the writers ever probably anticipated and it's the fans that sort of take it on as you said and move and bring it into a whole new sort of level of interactivity. Uh, what you might call transmedia fandom. The fans are intent on filling the gaps. The gaps are the important spaces where these stories exist. Um, and Star Wars being one of the biggest sort of uh, franchises, which again has been sort of talked about a lot, 
you could argue that you know what has been established on screen or on television uh, by the writers, producers, and now lastly, of course, Disney, uh, pales in comparison to the sort of canon, or you might call fanon, that exists online, uh, in fan fiction, in self-created sort of participatory text. Uh, just sort of talking to my students uh, who uh, have a sort of yeah, uh, interest, often enthusiasm to big, with uh, big franchises like Star Wars, um, you could argue what is a Star Wars text? What is the official? What is canon? And what indeed is extra? Um, the expanded universe to Star Wars, for Star Wars was in many ways the most important bit for fans before J.J. Uh, Abrams and Disney started tinkering with it, uh, adding uh, films that, as Billy this morning alluded to, haven't done, gone down that well with fans. Um, the expanded universe actually is where all the stories are told, whether it be in novels, fan fiction, comics, and indeed some of the videos, uh, one of which I want to show you a snippet of in a second, because um, they extend the text well beyond the film screen, well beyond that two-hour movie that uh, comes up once in a while or, thanks to Disney, every two or three years on a sort of regular pace. What fans produce becomes that sort of living world, that meta-universe, that narrative universe that they sort of remain in, partake in, expand daily. Um, you know, you could argue they are paratexts, sort of extra two surrounding the sort of central text you, or for some, they could be indeed the central text, the ones that exist as canon. Uh, and we talked about authorship before, uh, uh, talking about you know, the role of the author and, and taking an author's sort of story and making it transmedia. Uh, for fans, the text is theirs to play with as they want. It's that sense of shared ownership. Uh, they've lived with it, they've consumed it, they've um, um, written into it. So that sort of slippage between who is the author here, you can argue that the fan base is the sort of multiple author of myriad texts, myriad paratexts, videos, etc. And as I said, that creates a, a different canon, a completely new canon uh, that actually exists well beyond the established one Disney uh, has created and now plums very deeply with, uh, thanks to recent The Mandalorian, and everyone loves Baby Yoda. Um, that's all we seem to know about the Mandalorian. There's, there's this <laughs> cute baby that goes like this a lot. Um, uh, and, and that's what I'm going to say to my students tomorrow, because I haven't seen it yet. Although John's got a hooky uh, USB with episodes that I'm going to try and sort of watch at some point. Uh, is, w at what point does Star Wars become this illicit, illegal bit of uh, uh, content, a bit like the sort of uh, video nasties of the 80s. So you, Not quite. You, you share the sort of USB. Here's the Mandalorian. Shh, here you go. That, that is shared amongst fans because we in the UK haven't got Disney Plus officially yet. Uh, but we all bloody Can know I say about something it. about Yeah, that. go on. I think there's something really powerful about the idea of discovered content. Mm. Like there's something about that kind of passing it back type yeah. thing. And I think that we're all, everybody wants our eyeballs, is what I always say. Like everyone wants our attention. Like, ads going on the buses that are going by things that are popping up on our phones you can't walk down some streets without things pinging on your phone from the stores that are selling stuff yeah. and I think that we very much listen to each other now like as a peer review type thing so the idea of discovered content so like if you said something to us now about you know well it's not really out yet but check this out mm, mm. I bet we'd all go and check it out yeah, whereas yeah. if we walked outside and there's a poster we'd probably be a little bit blind to it because sure. we're mm. sick of being told what we should look at we listen to each other more, like as fans as well, don't Well, you indeed, think? and it spreads through word of mouth or through sort of links shared. Exactly. Yeah. And this is how I found what I, uh, basically is, for me, become the original Star Wars text now. I, you know, uh, I found this uh, Australian Star, uh, Star Wars fan video uh, through, a, through a trailer for it. I linked through a YouTube reference that fans sort of, you know, then sort of suggested you should watch this. And this then becomes, uh, in many ways... Uh, the real text for me, uh, partly because of my love of Australian soap operas and my awareness of sort of, you know, <laughs> Australian culture and some of the sort of stereotypes that circulate within Australian media. Uh, Star Wars Down Under, which I highly recommend. It's a half hour movie. Uh, you can get it free on YouTube. This is the two minute trailer for it, if we want to have a look. <laughs> Do the lights work on here? <laughs> Brilliant. It's hard. Um, What's with the Australian love of Australian soap operas? I, I, I grew up watching Neighbours. Okay. Um, my wife's Australian. Okay. Too. Um, 
So this is described on YouTube as Star Wars Down Under, an epic tale of the good, the bad, and the thirsty. This is if you mash up a cheap Australian beer commercial with Star Wars. <laughs> I just know that's the first time I've ever had subtitles and it... The, the, <laughs> <laughs> say what? You know, we're like translating Australian now on you... I, <laughs> so, so that just, you know, so, so we're canon now, you know. Uh, we're talking about multiverses this morning and the sort of quantum physics of fandom. Does this exist somewhere in the original concept, George Lucas, of the sort of... <laughs> You know, the Republic, that Merv Bushwhacker is that long lost Jedi searching for something bigger, deeper, more important. And this is obviously, as I said, a fan product. It's a half hour movie and this was just a, a short sort of trailer for it. Um, so it really extends the whole notion of story and transmedia storytelling. And to what extent is this more um, official, authentic than any of the sort of content produced by Disney sort of post um, the buyout in 2012, 14 or whenever it was. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of sort of canonicity or fanonicity, we've got some interesting sort of uh, transmedia storytelling, you know, helps us open up what stories actually become part of that sort of multi-universe. The fan story now and the way fans take it, run with it and explore it. And as you said, people that write this stuff have to be aware about what fans are going to do with it, probably beyond expectation and prediction. Yes. Um, and, and, and the sort of... Sort of want to sort of uh, head into the next thing that we're going to talk about, I guess, is this, the idea of the he hero's journey, which we've talked about, where the fan becomes central to that sort of transmedia storytelling, mm -hmm. whether it's the sort of content that is produced for them to explore uh, using online you know, apps and, and, and various things, or indeed placing themselves in the story. Yeah. And I think that there was a question raised to Roger this morning about um, something going viral. And I loved your answer that was basically quite fundamentally connecting with people on an emotional level, yeah. something people can get behind. Yeah. And if you look at that from the narratives, from the point of view of things like Make America Great Again, um, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, but equally those narratives have been used for Arab Spring and ISIS. Like they're, they're the same arc and they've got the same way of bringing people as a collective together. Mm. So there's no one hero in those. Mm. The narrative shifts and changes, so there's not one central person, 
Because if you have one hero in those stories, Ned Stark in Game of Thrones gets killed really quickly. Spoilers. <laughs> I don't know if by now you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> but like Ned Stark he looked like the hero, didn't he? And then he got killed really quickly, maybe the first or second episode. Yeah. And we understand really quickly then that no one's going to come to save anyone in Game of Thrones. And I feel that that runs parallel with those narratives like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and ISIS. It's a movement of people, and the narrative shifts so much that as, a, as an audience, we're a little confused as to what to get behind. Mm. Sometimes mm. in a good way, sometimes in not such a good way. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, sort of um, mobile phone technologies and games on, on your app allow you to be a bit more of a sort of in control of your own story, for example. Yeah. Um, again, if anyone knows me, I always speak from myself and what I'm, I'm doing because I think it's got some interesting uh, uh, sort of connections to sort of real world applications. So this journey about the collective, uh, I see that in the game Pokemon Go, another obsession of mine. So Australian still? Film, uh, yeah, still, <laughs> still, I'm level 40, cracking on. Um, this has been going on for years. I, I'm, I'm deep, I'm it's deep, I'm, 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 I'm well gone. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the Pokemon Go as a game, you know, gives you that role as both the individual doing their bit on their phone, but part of that wider collective, because, you know, there's thousands, there's millions of, of people also playing this game. Uh, the game encourages you, if you don't know it, of course, to sort of transform the world in which you live into that gaming environment, where you play as a sort of uh, mobile avatar, looking for those crafty little creatures on the street, spinning uh, geographic stops that are located via GPS. Um, there's a, a map of Boston, for example. People create their own sort of uh, hacks of the game where you can see where all the Pokemon are, so you could travel to go catch them. Uh, uh, it's an immersive game, so those real spaces become virtual spaces in which you need to sort of travel to. And increasingly, the game has become more of a collective enterprise. It's not just you individually collecting uh, Pokemon on your personal journey. Um, it encourages that collective fans gathering. So a couple of years ago, Chester uh, was the first UK city to create a Pokemon Go themed treasure hunt, which allowed you to sort of interact with historical locations in the city. At the same time, you pick up special rewards virtually in the game. I would suggest any non-Pokemon Go players don't go to Liverpool in April because the weekend is happening. It's the first UK safari zone where people have paid their 60 quid entry fee uh, to go and, and basically do this around Liverpool, looking at their phones, collecting Pokemon, spinning stops, battling each other. Um, so the city... Uh, because the, once you've got your virtual ticket, then the Pokemon will appear on your phone and not someone else's who hasn't paid the entry fee. But you're not going into anywhere, you're going into just Liverpool. Liverpool, the city streets, Sefton Park is another sort of place where the fans will congregate. Um, so, the, so the streets are transformed. The city is mastered by fans who have never travelled to Liverpool. I've got people on the chats talking about that collector. How many people are going to Liverpool? When are we renting the van? Let's all go up there. Let's invade the north, etc., etc., etc. So all those narratives uh, come up. Uh, so the city becomes the fans to control and manipulate. Um, but also, and people have said, of course, it's a game. It's looking for cash. It's, it's looking for you to sort of go deeper and further into the game. I, I won't say how much I've spent on it. My wife's not here, thankfully. Um, it encourages that community action, too. There are sort of agendas that Niantic, the creator of the game, encourage fans to get involved with their local community. They've had beach cleans. They've had recycling campaigns. So you go along to a specific site to do a job. You'll get a virtual reward. At the same time, you're meeting new people share the love of the game and doing something good for the environment or something good for the local community so the collective as you said there is used rather than the individual looking at their phone it's about getting them out outside and, and joining up with the collective is it, is it an exercise in surreptitious mm -hmm. data gathering it, it can be yes it, i it, mean because who owns niantic is is a company that works with the pokemon game company game freak that sort of licensed licensed and the, then, do you uh, know who owns it Niantic. Um, yeah, I wish I did. Um, it's, by, it's spun out of Alphabet, and the whole thing is that it's an exercise in. Not my talking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Not my talking. Yeah, With the community sorry, standing sorry. around. Sorry, I meant the, the interactive sure. Group. Yeah. Oh yeah, but when we're when we're playing on a phone, we're talking about various things. Yeah, right. The community thus grows and grows out of the game, and and and, this, and and absolutely the cynicism is there. It's about 
you know, that event in Liverpool, for example, it's like, well, here's Niantic, all wanting us to go, absolutely spending our cash. It's, it's, but out of that, there's a subversive elephant, ele elephant, and that, <laughs> that <laughs> element of fandom that comes through, where they, that they, we have uh, people that sort of uh, spoof, they, they sort of try and sort of strip the data down so they can sort of mold the game to where they want to play and not being forced into those the channels that Niantic are trying to force you to go. Um, but but it, going back to what you're saying about the sort of personal story, clearly Niantic and others are trying to sort of hit the sort of nostalgia button. They are trying to sort of really sort of push the personal here. The player's journey is key to the story experience, but they do play with that in a sort of nostalgia um, button. They do want you to sort of immerse yourself in a story that they are clearly uh, creating for you. Here's the marketing for the most recent sort of um, feature in the game, the, the buddy system, where you can sort of take AR pictures of your Pokemon as if they're th there on the street, interact with them, feed them, etc. So it's sort of taking that sort of gaming element onto the sort of real streets. This is Ni uh, Niantic's advert for that and I think this is absolutely what we're talking about the sort of uh, creating the personal to, to try and engage people obviously I have to get to the advert because it's a computer game that's not say that's a trail for uh, Nintendo and uh, Niantic or a trail for a new episode of Black Mirror you, you're, you're <laughs> it's up to you really but I, I think you know interesting that they are playing on those sort of emotional ties that fans create with media franchises they're clearly aware of the sort of who you know the the, the co-opting co of, of, of fans into sort of extending the brands extending the narratives but like with the previous episode uh, video I showed I think fans are able to play within those margins and often create more subversive texts that are more enjoyable, I think, is, is the key point. But they're there. playing on nostalgia too, aren't yeah. they? Like the famous Don Draper sw uh, speech about nostalgia. Mm. Right, the kid's there, the little boy with the toy, and now he's, what, I don't know, 18, and he's got the little thing there. Yeah. It's smart. But also, it's some of the techniques that have worked so well with transmedia storytelling. You know, you create environments where the fans can capture content, take photographs, mm. share their progression. Mm. Yeah. You know, so they then share what they're doing and that plays into the marketing of all of it too. Right? Yeah, and I think the communities around these texts are more important. You know, using yeah. uh, other forms of social media to either talk about it and those narratives spill out in other platforms. Yeah. That extends the text yeah. beyond simply what we're fed through uh, your mobile phone yeah. or on YouTube, for example. Uh, and then some of those uh, characters, you know, can be used in, in, in own fan product, own fan content. And this mm -hmm. is the whole point of, behind um, Henry Jenkins' work, which has sort of created the, the world of fan studies as we know it today, mm -hmm. is that being participatory, it can be also very subversive. It can end up with uh, sort of uh, very combative and, and um, antagonistic 
uh, sort of rivalries between fans and between mm -hmm. sort of uh, factions of, of fans and some of research done by people in this room have sort of looked at that. So fandom is, is both supportive and celebratory, but it's also um, toxic. toxic, exactly, that's the word. And I think that's something that um, producers and story writers you know, should be aware of because those stories mean something very personal to the uh, fans and how they use and, um, and and sort of put them into their own sort of world's everyday experience. And it's, it's something very personal. You know, about protecting the integrity of the IP, right? Oh, absolutely. So, like a few years ago, I was called in to talk to BBC about Doctor Who. Mm. Can you imagine how excited I was then to have yeah. that opportunity? And they've got so much happening around Doctor Who. You can buy Doctor Who toilet roll. Mm. You can buy TARDIS earrings. Like, it's just, the franchise is crazy, mm. right? And they know that it's crazy. And they feel like it's this big funnel of stuff of Doctor Who that's just swirling. The Sarah Jane mysteries and the canine stories and all of that. Mm. And there's nothing really that's protected the integrity of the Doctor Who IP. And they know it needs to happen. Um, it won't happen right now, as things are. But there's something about as well the fans being able to step into a space where they know that that's protected. And it reminds me a little bit of how Matt probably felt when the Snow Witch was taken. That's what you were so passionate about as the writer. You wanted to protect the integrity of what you created. And there's something scary. If you don't have a fan base that will like police that with you and for you, it's a little bit open season, isn't it? Mm. There's, some, there's something just coming in the audience here called the Die Hearts of Doom, why Doctor Who is the short fans look Yes. Yeah. Right, really? yeah. It's kind of going through um, history when so you had um, second doctor Patrick Troughton hated him, everyone hated him, really? everyone hated Tom yeah, Baker, which we now see as kind of the quintessential. Yeah. So it's quite interesting when when you're saying, I think it was Jenkins who said fandom is about loving something so much that you hate it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and you can have that sort of occupy that position at the same time, can't you? That dual sort of Which is my personality. Which discovery thing this yeah. morning. I, I, love, I, think, I love Star Trek more than I love Star Wars by miles. Record um, that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Star Trek Discovery really, really upsets me. Yeah. Because... Wait, you see the <laughs> I've seen the car. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick Stewart, what, what's that look? <laughs> I think that protection of the integrity of the IP, like as a transmedia producer, if you like, that's how I would consider my role to step in. Mm. And I think the sweet spot of that is something that I like to call exclusive inclusivity, which sounds like a contradiction, right? But exclusive inclusivity for me is, for example, if you follow a certain faith or religion or a certain kind of sports team, when you're there with your people, you are absolutely included. You know, you're like one of the fans or one of the worshippers or one of whatever you might be, right? But then when you're not with your people, you're a little bit exclusive. Mm, yeah, so you, you kind of have that nice opportunity to create a franchise, if you like, that allows people to have that feeling. Because I think people inherently want to belong to something, which is maybe why ISIS did so well with recruiting, right? Mm. There's a lot of young men out there that want to feel they belong and they're part of the thing. And my spin on it is, as storytellers, we can create that in a positive way. And of course, that's not something you do quickly, right? Yeah, and, and scholars have talked about, you know, whole sort of textual universes that fans um, um, lo love and, and expand uh, from shows that don't exist, right? You know, so Galaxy Quest, the movie, inspires a whole fandom around a fake TV show called Galaxy Quest. Oh, yeah. So okay. fans have to create the content in order to watch the content, in order to sort of dress up as it. Right. Um, and community, Paul Booth's work on, on, on sort of uh, Doctor Space Time, or Inspector Space Time, which is a clear sort of parody of Doctor Who, because yeah. you can't have Doctor Who in an NBC show. <laughs> right. But this character of a sort of British detective with bowler hat <laughs> travelling in a red phone box <laughs> around time and space, that becomes a fan text, because then fans create their own stories. One of the actors who plays him in the show made his own sort of series of YouTube films. Right. Uh, BBC sort of sends cease and desist letters because it's, <laughs> yeah, but, but then it gets rebranded and renamed and sort of goes to another part of, of the web so they can't be found. And, and so then people dress up as Inspector Space Time at a convention. You think, well, who is that? Yeah. Well, it was a fake character on Community, which is a sort of half-hour sitcom yeah. from NBC. Mm -hmm. so, so you don't even have to have a text for fans to go, oh, I like that. Yeah. I'll have some of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll build it. I'll, I'll expand it. I'll cosplay it, mm -hmm. uh, and then it becomes a text. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been in cult involved with cosplay? 
Uh, I of, often cosplay as a lecturer. Um, <laughs> doesn't go so well. It doesn't go so well. Uh, no, I think the limit is, is my Slytherin scarf at a convention. Uh, or uh, I did wear robes to a lecture once. Uh, not the gown, but Slytherin robes, and they just thought I was an idiot. But, uh, but some, some students in the audience, they know, and it's about that sort of intertextuality, it's about the references, yep. so some people will understand and get that, other people think, well, what's Harry Potter? So, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, yeah, that's I, my extent. I turned, I turned up to a lecture in a Twilight t-shirt. Ooh, it's um, controversial. Well, I despise it. <laughs> I was being, maybe I was being post-ironic. Post-ironic, yeah. Confused yeah. about the ironics. But, um, but as soon as I walked into the room, the students all just started to pick at slip pants. Yeah. Laughing their heads off at it. And I was saying, what's funny about this? And it was a lecture on identity, and I was trying to yeah. make the point. And then the next week, I went in with a Taylor Swift t-shirt. Same thing happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wasn't being ironic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you really mean it. You're I a really fan. Loved Taylor. Well, this is it. And I think, you know, when people see that fan identity come through, yeah. It either can create interrelations and people think, well, I'm like that person. Yeah. Or, absolutely, there's like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I wouldn't right. be with them. And, and those, those sort of tri that tribalism yeah, comes yeah. through, which could end up in sort of real toxic. So from some of your research, what do you think is the sweet spot? Right? We've spoken about the toxicity, mm. but we've also spoken about the opportunity. Yeah. Like for me, when I look at a story, I kind of have three things spiralling around it. Yeah. I have the narrative design, the experience design, and the emotional design. And they're three things that I sort of iteratively try to consider mm. as I progress through whatever it is I'm doing. Yeah. Um, to figure, like, how do I want people to feel at the end of it? Mm. And I think often as storytellers, we don't figure out that part. Yeah. Um, I sometimes when I ask that question, people just say, I want them to feel good. And I go, yeah, that's a bit of a low bar, right? Mm. Do we want them to feel like angry? Do we want them to think they're a bit kind of crappy people? Do we want them to feel empowered? Do we want them to go home and hug their kids? Like to figure out how do we want them to feel at the end, for me is a little bit of like a design pathway that mm. we work through. But that could equally go wrong because we don't really know in the way that we don't know how people really see us, right? We all think people see us a certain way, but we never really know. Where, where do you think, in terms of your research, is a sweet spot that it's a safe bet? Well, the emotionality is, is key, I think. If yeah. you don't really connect with any of the characters, you're not going to follow them. So right. that's why I disengage with certain franchises and, and I stick with others because, you know, I see, see myself in them. You know, a lot of sort of work by Cornel Sanders talks about that sort of narcissistic view of fandom. You see yourself in the text, so it becomes yours. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think in many ways, that's why a series like Star Trek works, because if you re I've rewatched episodes to try and recreate that feeling I once had. It's not possible, is it? It's not possible, because, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, because it's located. It well, I guess it had to be located in that particular historical context, or um, an episode of Deep Space Nine. Here's some, uh, turn off the cameras, um, some personal reflection. So, so Kira and Odo are having a real intimate, close moment of friendship because uh, Odo thinks she's going to die. Spoiler alert, it's a, a changeling that's looking like Kira. So trying to uh, extract an emotional reaction out of him. And that resonated with me at the time because I had a particularly emotional sort of... Um, conversation with a friend earlier that day and I just happened to watch the episode and it's like oh my god this is like me 10 minutes ago or, or whatever <laughs> you know 10 years later you know right. it doesn't mean the same yeah. thing I remember feeling that way but it doesn't bring those right. emotions okay. through so I think it, it, it has to rely on the sort of context of that first watching yes and we bring ourselves to the story too all mm. the time don't yeah. we oh, that's what I love about storytelling is that um we can never live, say if we live even to 95, right? We can never have all the experiences that we would want to have. So I think we're always measuring ourselves through story. You know, would I have done that? Oh my God, I would have done that and mm. look what happened. Mm. There's something that's like endless and timeless about brilliant stories where we see ourselves. And a little bit like music, right? We could listen to, we could hear a song from way back when we were kids and we know all the words of the song. There's something about it that takes us back to a moment and makes us tap into memories and emotions yeah. that I think is brilliant. But then when we have the opportunity to create a collective around that and to create fandom around that, it could become a bit of a monster. Yeah, and, but, but also create sort of, I guess, false nostalgia. Uh, I never grew up listening to uh, Duran Duran or a Spandau Ballet. Or the, it, well, 
for me, it was Boxcar Willy and Five Star. No, was it? Because, Star. well, that's right. There you go. Boxcar Willy, because my dad would have that on in the background, so that's all I'd hear. And Five Star, I don't know why. You know uh, the words, uh, don't you? I, probably. And the moves. But only now, now I'm listening to all those 80s tunes, yeah. and because that apparently epitomises the period where I grew up, but I never listened to them in the first place. So right. it does create a sort of nostalgic response, but yeah. one based on a false set of memories, I think. Yes, right. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Because the, the point you were raising about storytelling and about Australia, mm. it occurred to me, just listening to you talk about the, the space that's being filled by a band, about Dickens. Mm. That when Dickens, each chapter it would take a month to arrive. Mm. So that means that after, you know, wh whatever the chapter was, there'd be a month yep. for Australians to wonder what was going to happen next. Yep. And I just wondered if you, you ever looked at the question of what, how they reacted during that month, whether there was any record of them doing the same kind of thing before transmedia. I don't know the answer to that, whether there's record. But I do have some thoughts on it. What happened with Dickens? I mean, in, in, in America they were waiting for the next instalment of Dombey and Son. The yeah. fans were actually at the dock. Yeah, they became so that. feverish. Oh, that really? Some of them fell in and drowned. Oh, that's yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so, so Dickens, but at the time when Dickens was writing this serial fiction, he was admonished. He was destroyed by the literary establishment. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's right. They thought there was a laudanum type drug. That was a quote. Mm. Yeah. So, so serial fiction because of the, 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 the what, what would you call it? The addiction. Yeah. But they saw it as addiction, but it's kind of a delayed gratitude, isn't it? Yeah. So, so for, for them, they, so they thought this is dangerous. But it really was dangerous. Dangerous in the sense that Dickens was talking about social issues at the time, and the working classes might, you know, kind of say, <laughs> no, let's rise up. Yeah, right. But I do feel as well there's a point in that. So we could binge watch shows on Netflix, yeah. like Bojack Horseman, Arrested Development, Kimmy Schmidt, in a weekend, or even House of Cards, right? And they're created in a way that, you know, you're a real saddo, not you, but I am, because you do like 45 minutes and you go, oh, I could fit another one in, right? And then you're in bed, or like that, with your iPad. Oh, God. Because they won't. So it's designed that you binge it in a weekend. And then I think the way that they drop those titles on the Monday, everyone rushes whether they're rushing into work or they're rushing to the keyboard. But shows like um, Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad, when they were first released, they made you wait for the week. Yes. And there was something about that week, because what that allowed was for some fans to be more knowledgeable and be more super fans, and they'd do blog posts and they'd like hold court, if you like, for the other fans to come in. So there's something about the pacing of that experience too, isn't there, that t you have but to that's wait. that's why I was wondering whether it happened in the Yeah, century. I don't know. Did not for Dickens. Yeah, Dickens was especially Dickens. I know there was an other people writing up them around that time. There's a great book by Frank Rose called The Art of Immersion, mm. which he talks about what he calls Dickens the master of the serial. And really, I mean, if you think about what a serial is, yes, it's about those what long long form storytelling to get to know characters over longer, but it's also a capitalist tool. Mm. <laughs> it is about well, Matt, Matt Freeman calls it commodity breeding. Mm. So you bring all these things together. What is it? Entertainment set in stones, Matt? Some mob. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so what it is is the cliffhanger was invented yeah. for this exact reason. Right. And it was literally someone hanging off. I think it was Flash Gordon hanging off the edge of a cliff. Mm. Yeah. When you were a child. Yeah. Exactly, and you never exactly know that. the next week whether you're going to have a Batman that was no good or <laughs> Superman that was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But that goes back to the manipulatory area of storytelling, Absolutely. right? Mm. And it can be used for good, like everything, and can be used for bad. I think it's both. Mm. Right. That's, why, that's why when you say, what was your term again, Alison? Exclusive inclusivity. It's, it's, it's what we would call a dialectic, right? It's mm. just right. a complex yeah. mixture yeah. of both. Right. So when you talk about what you're talking about, Lincoln, with, um, okay, Pokemon app is, is what, did, what did you say it was about? Um, Data it's collection. Data so it's data capture. Mm. Yes, it is that, but it's also very effective for people yep. who are involved. I've seen Lincoln at conference, must be for the last four years, mm. three or four years, at conferences, and I'm like, where's Lincoln gone? <laughs> and I look around the corner and he's, what? He's doing this. I'll oh, stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> London. Looking for Pokemon. Yeah, London. yeah. yeah. they're, they're everywhere. Field. They're everywhere. Norfolk. <laughs> yeah, but, but the, so the exclusivity is that, you know, is about the regionality. So your Pokemon will come with a geotag to it. So, so, so it's in your collection. And, you know, for some competition in fandom, you know, where's your furthest Pokemon from? 
Australia, Hong Kong, uh, right. United States, you know. Some people try and get some rare ones. China doesn't have Pokemon Go, but in a certain part of China, on the border with Hong Kong, of course, you will, can get a, a Pokemon that will say China on it. So, so that's the ultimate rarity, and you won't trade that. Yeah, yeah well, uh, yeah, coronavirus. Well, this is what spoofers do. So they sit in their living room and do it through GPS hacking, and they never go anywhere. So there's the hierarchy. That's what you call a spoofer. Yeah. So they spoof themselves into other countries, and so so there is that's comp cheating. It is cheating, and other people say, well. <laughs> okay. that, that means that they're in two places at once. Well, that's it. The temporality is completely, you know, out the window. Spatiality. Well. And, and spatiality. Yeah. But the platforms are interesting. Like you're saying, you know, things can be binge watched immediately, you know. I got into Star Trek Next Generation because, you know, being in the UK, it came out, what, two, three years after? Very, very long time. Very long like, time. It's the same with films, right? Yeah. Sort of, Large space. Film coming out in, if Star Wars came out in December in America, we would get it like July. Yeah. yeah. And then I only, and then I would encounter it in the video store at the bottom of the road. Two episodes per video, you know. You go yeah, rent, <laughs> watch those, and then go back, and then you have to wait another two years before the next season comes out. Now we're spoilt for choice. Now we got to pull for the USB stick. Exactly, naughty <laughs> USB sticks, and 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 this is this is the nature of the sort of that sort of uh, abundance of narrative talking about the multiverse again, and it's how much is too much, and maybe this is where. Now. Now, yeah, it's, too it, much. it's all too much, yeah. and that's why maybe Star Wars has gone down that sort of valley of you have to wait for quality years between, and you could fill the gaps with new stories. You could read authors would expand the universe here, mm -hmm. there, and everywhere. Now it's like film after film after film. But look at Avatar. That was two thousand and nine. That movie. Yeah, we're and still it waiting. Just shot two, three, four, and five all at the same time. Yeah, so we're going to get them in a, a huge binge. But Probably. that's a whole different audience now. Yes. Right? Yeah. Totally. Well, yeah, I mentioned, it works. I mentioned I that to either. students. Succession. Sorry? Succession season two was yes. on for about a month, and then they took it off again. That's right. And there's an entire online forum the one about where is Succession two. <laughs> okay, really? Seriously, they just took, they put it on for a very short window, and then took it off. Oh, well, wow. that again creates exclusivity, doesn't yes. it? So if you've seen it, you're part of the lucky few. That's right, yeah. Exactly. Do you find it difficult these days to... Like because Picard is, is coming out weekly, I'm finding that I might have been become more attuned to binging, mm -hmm. mm. or at least having it there. Yep. So now that it's coming out every week, I'm kind of becoming a bit annoyed. <laughs> yeah, I don't oh, like and it. again, that's that fan service. The fans expect it to be immediate. Or well, it's, it's kind of like it feels like it's. If it, someone said to me the other day, so it's really slow, isn't it? I said, I don't know if it's slow if we have it all. Yeah. 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 But we're impatient now. And I reckon the no, students, which I wouldn't call them out on, I bet they don't like reading stuff. They want stuff straight away. Oof. Like it's a different era that like the younger kids have been brought up in, that everything's there at the touch of your fingers. You know, rather than read the book, you can watch the video. My students don't read books. Right, that's what you said earlier, yeah. 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 I mean, it's a tragedy. It's a shame. It's a shame. I actually don't think that's true. Okay. Um, what we're seeing in publishing is that more people read now than ever. Wow, really? But they are reading in different formats and different media and different yeah, ways. Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, you're, you're talking about fiction. Sorry, I was talking about academic work. Yeah. yeah. So fiction, yeah, I think that's probably true. That is so what are the different ways. ways then? What are you seeing? Well, I mean, we've, we've all been reading, right? We read social media. We read BuzzFeed articles. We read Twitter. We read, you know, and, and I would say that they, you know, they are reading academic texts. Part of the problem is, is that they haven't been taught how to read academic texts, so mm. they read it like fiction oh, and right. then get frustrated because they don't understand it, mm. which, fair enough. Um, so, you know, there's lots out there, and they are reading things. I mean, if you just look at fan conversation on, on Tumblr or Twitter, they're talking about some of the same theories that we are. Mm -hmm. um, they just, you know, don't feel the need to go back to some old white guy who said it in 1943, um, you know, at, which fair enough, they're not academics, so they yeah. don't have to. Yeah. No. But there is a sense of something that's immediate now, like everything's at the end of our fingertips, right? We don't well, want to wait. Like what there's, there's a danger of being too generalistic about, about that generation. Yeah. Oh, I don't mean just that generation. I mean generally. Yeah, like, like now. You, for me, like you said, you don't like to wait anymore, and I kind of feel like that too. I, I didn't realise that I didn't that I, that I cared, but it was just like 
I don't like this weekly weird. It reminds me of. I don't know when we were watching when you talked about when you mentioned Neil this before. Every day, right? Every day you were. Yeah, but the soaps have to be on every day. Yeah. No one would wait a week for that, would they? <laughs> they would. They, well, they had the on. Yeah. They had the omnibus, which was on Sunday, where all the episodes were shown as one long movie. Oh God, different, way of, different way of consuming a soap. Do you still see online sets that are come out sequentially? You look at web series, which are becoming very popular. Mm. They're not all released at once. They're released as though they're blogs or, or, or vlogs. And audiences are waiting for those. And part of that waiting is that part of the joy in that mm-hmm. is anticipation. Yeah. So, yeah. you know... Oh, I'm so filling the gap it's, it's with stories. I think that ties as well into the structure of the story. You mm. know, there's sometimes when I'm working with, whether it's students or clients, it becomes very evident very quickly that this needs to be episodic, mm. and something very um, intriguing and addictive to episodic. But then there's the question of duration. How long will people give to it? And then how long will people wait for it in between? And it's yeah. about getting that balance right. I did a project for Harlequin, Mills and Boone, that was a web series, 39 lots of three minutes, ran over 13 weeks. And each episode of three minutes would drop on a Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I reckon by week four, everyone was bored with it already. Mm. It's too long, 13 weeks of three, ugh, too much. So it's about as well testing and prototyping, I think, who the audience are, what they expect. There's no, I love it, because there's no one size fits all. No, there's no, there's no kind of solution to just everyone will be happy. Right, because it's and so I, and unique. I think, I think it's right to say that, to generalise. I mean, I was just talking about me. I don't know about anyone else. That's why I was asking if the way for... I mean, for me, it's like when I read a book. I have to read for long periods of time before I become lost. Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm looking for. And if, I, and if I'm binging something, it's, I mean, the word binge is horrible. Because mm. <laughs> yeah. it implies I'm doing something wrong. Mm. And yeah. it's like that word guilty pleasure. Why is it not just pleasure? <laughs> it's like guilty pleasure is like, is that not sneaking downstairs to eat some chocolate at midnight? <laughs> Sounds good to me. But, but it's like, it's like if, I, if I can binge something, like, um, I don't know if anyone's watched The Expanse on Amazon Prime. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, so in that, if I just put that on and watch four hours of it, I'm in space. <laughs> and I just get lost. But that weekly thing pulls me out. Yeah, right. And I think yeah. getting lost is kind of what I want. <laughs> That's nice. More than anything. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to draw it all to a close okay. now. Get so lost. It, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a fantastic day.